All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. Sure brought no cards. Uh, my name is Farzad. I'm uh, with the Tastemaker team. This is Kayvon. Tastemaker and, team um, as well. And uh, yeah, so let's we'll just jump right into it. Um, you guys all know why you're here. Uh, in three years, the San Francisco-based Yours Truly has become one of the hottest music video brands on the web. Their mission to discover and document, celebrate and interrogate, capture and catapult those artists who, without question, demand our affection. In three short years, they've produced nearly 300 videos, built a number of high-profile partnerships, and in the process have worked with some of the hottest artists in indie music today. Just a few right here. Arab Music, Best Coast, Camera Obscura, Damn Funk, Emma, Freddie Gibbs, Grimes, Holly Miranda, In Love, John Vanderslice, Kurt Vile, Local Natives, Morning Benders, Night Jewel, Odd Future, Pure X, Real Estate, Shabazz Palaces, Twin Sister, Unknown Mortal Orchestra, Veveter, Washed Out, Yellow Wolf, and Zola Jesus. So that just leaves off Quincy Jones and the XX, and you got the entire alphabet there. Their collaboration together. <laughs> yeah. So today we're honored to be in conversation with Will Bramson. Uh, we'll discuss the, his background, what makes yours truly, truly theirs, how they've grown, the obstacles they've faced, what they're cooking up, and what's in store for the future. Plus, a little later, we'll be hanging out with Chris Chu, who you just saw in that video of the Morning Benders, now Pop Etc., which we'll also learn about a little later. Hang out will be live from Brooklyn. We do ask that you stay until the end of the video. We have uh, two camcorders back there, and we don't want your head popping up. We try to make, we're going to make this part of the Tastemaker series. So many of you were here at our first talk for uh, Stephen Allen. This is uh, the Morning Benders with, uh, and, and um, yours truly. And then we'll also be doing one on design with Eve Bahar coming up. So uh, without further ado, please welcome them to, uh, to Google, Will Abramson. All right, well, we thought a, a fitting introduction for anyone who hasn't seen your videos is a quick reel. This is from the series In My Room that you guys do um, with MTV. Let's check it out. It's not for an event, really. It's not for money. It's not for, like, there's no proper show. It's just you're just playing your songs again. It strips <laughs> down. There's just, like, a group of people sitting around you and you're playing your songs. shows you remember the most you know because you get like a genuine audience reaction like you can play on a huge stage and you can you can uh, you know have great sound and everyone's into it but then you know you walk backstage and you, know, you never see those people you don't get any I like, think it's also feedback. more fun because um, you just don't you're not afraid and so I'm just gonna go for it and I'm not nervous at all yeah. Having it amplified kind of feels like less official, so you can just kind of have fun. Yeah, you know? totally. Like if it's not amplified, all of a sudden, like everything that happens is just happening right now, which makes like playing the songs, you know, like every time can be its own different thing. You know, it doesn't have to be played the way that it's supposed to be played, which is cool. Um, all right, Will, uh, where were you born and raised, and uh, what did creativity mean to you growing up? Um, 
I was born in New Hampshire, but I grew up in Cupertino. Uh, I, I come from a very musical stock. Both my grandmothers, one of which is sitting right here, uh, played piano. My grandma played recorder. Uh, my dad would sing Beach Boys songs to me in the bathtub when I was a baby. And on weekends, when my mom was cleaning the house, she would play Frank Sinatra and George Gershwin songs uh, throughout the family stereo, pausing only to make sure that I'd slow dance with her at least once a weekend. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I saw my very first show at the Shoreline Amphitheater. Uh, it was my dad and I's favorite band at the time, R.E.M. And uh, in sixth grade, I proclaimed to my parents that Oasis was the second coming of the Beatles. By seventh grade, I realized that they weren't the second coming of anything. Um, and uh, it was then that on family trips to San Francisco, my parents would drop me off at Amoeba with a brown bag lunch so I could spend the whole day um, looking for records. Uh, senior year of high school, the same year that I, uh, my friends and I won a battle of the bands for this rap group we were in called All About Backflips. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, my future co-founder and best friend and I, Bob, uh, started a music magazine called Paper Airplane. And um, it was also that same year that I realized that you could actually study music industry in school. Um, and I think um, I realized that I wanted to be in the music business when I was grounded on Halloween. My dad took me to go see the movie Almost Famous. And there's that really nerdy guy who hangs out with rock stars. And it was sort of then that I realized that he wasn't nerdy at all. He was the coolest dude I'd ever seen. And that <laughs> that's what I wanted to do. So um, creativity for me as a kid was really just about pursuing whatever felt right. Like I was always journaling a lot. And um, when I discovered hip hop, I immediately just started writing um, in the style that I was listening to. Um, I, where I was never really musically inclined, like I can read music and play piano, but um, I've really just always approached music as a collector. You know, I, I think um, it's just something that has always spoken to me and I, it was there from when I was a kid and I can't imagine my life without it, really. So what, two things in there. One is in the preparation for this interview, you didn't tell me about that hip-hop group because <laughs> you knew I, I would have found that. Um, <laughs> But secondly, you, you mentioned pursuing a, a career in music you found out about school. And so, um, yeah, so at what point did you make the decision to go down to USC and then? Yeah, the so um, when I was in high school, I, when I graduated, um, I went to Chico State, which had a really great uh, music industry program. But um, there were aspects of that program that I liked. For example, they had their own record label. They had a great college radio station. But it wasn't in one of the hubs for the music industry, which is New York and L.A. Yeah. So. Um, I applied to the music industry program, the Bachelor of Science in Music Industry, and got in. And so I moved to LA. And the first summer I got there, before I uh, before I went to school, I was interning at Universal. And so uh, I interned from one o'clock until seven p.m. in the afternoon. And before that, to pay for my apartment, um, I was working at Coffee Bean from five in the morning until noon. And so I had that whole summer to sort of like get ready for this transition I was making to go to USC and. At USC, it was really, um, I kind of cut my teeth just um, doing internships, and I became the hip-hop music director at our radio station, and it was there that I first interviewed an artist for the first time. I had um, Merce come on my show, and, uh, and I also inter interviewed Atmosphere, who in high school was like my favorite rapper. And um, I'll never forget the feeling of just being in the presence of someone that you have such respect for and reverence for. And that nervous feeling you get, much the same way as sitting out in front of an audience of people that you don't know. Um, but <laughs> that same feeling that I had then has transferred over to every single interview I've ever done. And that feeling that I get when meeting someone that you really love and, and have invested your emotions into is still so exciting to me. And I just kept chasing that throughout college and then in my professional life when I graduated. Um, actually, before I graduated, I got an internship at Yahoo Music. And then when I graduated, I became a full-time employee there and founded the indie music department there. Um, and just I tried to figure out how to fit interviewing artists and being around artists into pretty much every aspect of my job, wherever I could. Because I, I just thought I wanted to develop that skill, but I also just found it so exciting and rewarding, too. Let's talk about uh, one of the first endeavors you did. Um uh, when you were working at iMeme, at yeah. Yahoo, I suppose. And that was an interview city uh, series called Keys to the City. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. So um, iMeme uh, was a streaming music service, and I got there pretty early on when they were still figuring out their strategy, their content strategy. 
And um, I had a lot of leeway to come up with programs and launch programs that I thought would help market the brand in different ways. And so one of the site's main constituencies was hip hop. And so I started a documentary series called Keys to the City where I would go to all these various locales to document the local hip hop scenes and have rappers take me around their hometowns. The first one we did was in Philly. Uh, it was The Roots and Diplo who participated in that one. Nice. And then uh, um, we went to Seattle to do a documentary series about all the Seattle MCs who really, it's like a really um, strong scene up there, but they haven't been able to launch any national stars. But when you go there, it's like this big fraternity. And the Keys to City series was really eye-opening because um, we were traveling on our own dimes to do this. It didn't have any support from iMeme. It was just stuff that myself and Bob would do, my, my partner Bob would do on the weekends. And so we flew ourselves to LA, we flew ourselves to Seattle, all over the place to, to do this series because we thought that it, this, these stories needed to be told. And this was my first experience with video production at all. I mean, we, rent, we borrowed Bob's cousin's kind of like crappy camera to go do this stuff. And we just went and tried it. And I, I think a lot of you know, the skills that I acquired for being an interviewer and being a producer came from this trial and error that we were um, getting in this Keys to the City series. But we ended up getting some great acts. Like uh, we interviewed The Game in Compton and around LA. And uh, Nate went up to, uh, went up to uh, Canada to do a piece on Cardinal Official, who's a really big Canadian rapper. And they took him around Toronto for, for a couple of days and he came back with some great stuff from there. And it was also at iMeme that I met both Nate and Caleb, who, um, who round out our, our founding crew at Yours Truly. Um, Nate was actually, if you go to the next slide, Nate was um, uh, producing and, and shooting takeaway shows, which are basically um, kind of the, the grandfathers of performance videos online. And so the difference is on Keys of the City, it was just interviews strictly. It was interviews and, and just kind of more, do, more do documentary. So like the funny thing is, is not a lot of that content's actually online because it was all uploaded to iMeme, which no longer exists. So you can't really go back and watch a lot of the Keys to the City stuff. But we did stuff on uh, Rafael Sadiq in Oakland. Um, a bunch of great videos that I think are hopefully on hard drive somewhere, but they're definitely not online anymore. Yeah, this is uh, the Takeaway Show started about 2006, and that's um, from the blog, blog called La Blogatech. I'm sure you guys are familiar with them, and um, they sort of had a, a network of bloggers, and uh, you and Nate, I guess, um, both were. Yeah, so in Nate, um, I, I didn't know Nate, but he was shooting Takeaway Shows, um, and he connected with the mission of the takeaway shows and reached out to the founder, Cried, and he was the San Francisco arm of the takeaway shows. And I'd found Cried separately just from being a huge music fan. And when Cried came to San Francisco for Noise Pop in 2007, he introduced me to Nate. He's like, you know one of the dudes in the takeaway shows lives here. And so immediately uh, upon meeting Nate, he and I started working on stuff together. Um, we started producing videos that ended up on iMeme and um, producing takeaway shows like this Leaky Lee takeaway, sh takeaway show we shot. Uh, on a beautiful, blustery San Francisco day. Um, and it was also at that time that I met Caleb at one of those like music industry schmooze fest kind of things. And uh, Caleb and I actually connected over our mutual admiration for The Walkman, the band The Walkman. And um, yeah, we right. actually just had the chance to shoot The Walkman after years of kind of like waiting and hoping that we would get a chance to work with them. So. Um, just on this past tour, they were here? Yeah, just yeah. on this past tour. They came for their 10-year anniversary show. So they came by studios at Different Fur, Different Fur, which is on 19th and Valencia. It's actually where we shot the very first George Truly video with Waves. Um, and I think when he was doing the video, he thought that he was shooting a takeaway show. And uh, surprise, it was a George Truly video. <laughs> So, I mean, I feel like we've already gotten pieces of the story, but kind of like what was missing in the music industry or what was missing in your, in your view that kind of, you know, birthed yours truly? I mean, I feel like we've, we've heard a little bit of the pieces, but like put, us to get, put it together for us. Yeah, um, I think, you know, we look, took a hard look at the, the, the music landscape at the time and we saw these different verticals. There's sales and subscription, there's news and criticism, there's music discovery, which was the thousands of music blogs that we read every day, and there's music as lifestyle. And one of our biggest challenges was figuring out how could we differentiate ourselves in this already overcrowded space? What could we do to compel users to come to yours truly instead of any of these other music brands that they trusted every day? And so in figuring out that value proposition, one of the things that is just as important as to figuring out who you are 
is to figure out what you're not. And so we knew that you know, if you wanted a record review, you'd go to Pitchfork. If you wanted to watch a music video, you'd go to YouTube. If you wanted to listen to an MP3, you go to Hype Machine. But if you wanted to learn more about an artist beyond their MP3 or watching their music video, if you wanted to get to know them as people or to watch them create their craft you know, firsthand, like you're sitting right there, there really wasn't much out there for you. And so instead of you know, trying to compete with all these brands up here, we decided that if we were going to win, we had to invent our own game. And so we used what skills we had, which was talented filmmakers, passionate journalists, and we created a format to put the artists that we loved in, a, in the best light possible. And so what the takeaway shows were doing was they were putting artists into their format, which was the takeaway show, which to me is still the most revolutionary format out there. But we decided that we wanted to adapt per artist and give them whatever situation fit them the best. And from a brand perspective, it was really just about focusing on what we thought we could do really well and iterating on that process and innovating within those, those confines. And so it's really just kind of a choice between do you want to be McDonald's or do you want to be In-N-Out Burger? McDonald's has something for everyone. You know, they got chicken nuggets and those suck and the Big Macs suck too. But when you go to In-N-Out Burger, you know that there's three things on the menu and everything is good. You know exactly what you're getting and you get it every single time. Nice. All right, so, so well, you're not inspired by, by McDonald's. I'm not inspired by yeah, McDonald's. It's a good, it's a good although, segue. Although apparently when I was a baby, my nickname was William the Refrigerator Perry. They called me the Fridge. And apparently I could put down like three cheeseburgers as a two-year-old. <laughs> okay. So I think, I think people love her. I mean, I, I definitely do. And maybe I'm just going to latch on to like making this a question is, like, what are you inspired by? I mean, I feel like I, I watch so many of your videos and they have such a distinct, like, yours truly take on this. And, like, you've almost created, all, like, your own genre, right? Or your own, your own way of approaching music. What do you guys look for in inspiration, right? What, do you, what, do you, what inspires you guys or, you know, sent you on this path? Sure. Um, I think, you know, th there are four of us that do yours truly and each of us have uh, different points of inspiration. And it's the combination of those four people who come from very different backgrounds with very different sets of tastes that make yours truly what it is. But we also agreed on, on a few things about the brand. You know, we want, agreed on a few things we wanted the brand to stand for. But in terms of inspiration, um, I can just name a couple of things. Um, Wax Poetics Magazine is one of my all-time favorite magazines. It's incredibly well, well done, well researched. Um, it's, it's basically about you know, um, soul music and Latin music and uh, African-American culture throughout the years. Uh, their photo of the guy with the pink sunglasses is taken by Jason Nacido, who is the principal photographer at um, the Fader magazine. The bicycle is uh, by William Eggleston, who's largely considered to be the uh, father of color photography. Um, Aaron Rose is kind of your uh, kind of renaissance man. He's the curator of the Beautiful Losers, um, and just he really straddles the line between commercial and, um, and fine art. Um, there's also Jeff McFetridge on there, which uh, his hand has touched so many major brands, Pepsi, Nike, New York Times, you name it. Um, Jay-Z is kind of the king of the brand extension, in my opinion. You know, Jay-Z may not sell the most records, but he's by far the most well-respected artist. And he's been able to take the equity in his brand and apply it to so many different areas, yeah. which is truly amazing, I think. Um, so, and then the, the black and white image you see is a, a film by Bruce Weber um, on the, uh, the saxophone player Chet Baker. And that's, that film, you know, shot on 16 millimeter black and white, it's just such an amazing portrait of that artist. It's completely unflinching and, and a brave portrait of, of him. And, and ultimately what we wanted to do was set out to tell stories. And what the thing in common that all these things have is that these are all um, brands that do a great job of presenting stories in the most honest and direct way possible. And at the very base of it, you know, these are inspiration points, these are influences of ours, but at the end of the day, it's really the music. Yeah. I mean, there's no better feeling than finding a new artist. Like, I get no bigger rush than when Caleb sends me a band that I've never heard of, or when I find a band on a blog or on MySpace or Bandcamp that I've never heard of, and it's like you start listening and it's really good, and then you're like, oh God, please stay good, please stay good, and then it keeps being good, and then, <laughs> and then the song's over, and you're like, oh my God, if this band has one more good song, it's over. Like, <laughs> so um, it's really just the music, and there's so much that um, there's no 
shortage of inspiration out there. You know, every day or at least every week, Thank I try you. and make sure to find one band that blows me away. Then, Thank you, Internet. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Internet. <laughs> so discovery is a big part of uh, yours truly, but also can you tell us about uh, sort of the visual and philosophical concepts behind the brand, in particular the, the logo. Which sure. is absolutely beautiful, by the way. It's yeah. Like, it's a very distinctive. Uh, yeah, we, we, we spent about six months every weekend and most, uh, most weekend nights at Bob's house trying to figure out how to you know, present this logo. And Bob, um, who's the designer of this logo, is our creative director, and he's a graphic designer by trade. And so a lot of our graphical influences come from his vision and um, basically what we decided on was we wanted to think about what yours truly really was at its core and ultimately what we're doing is we're shadowing artists we're following them around we're capturing their stories but ultimately we're watching them we're standing behind them we're shadowing them and so this idea of the T shadowing the Y um, comes from that philosophy that we're there to you know discover and document capture and catapult and ultimately shadow these artists that we admire and deserve to be covered by us. Um, when you're starting to get this thing off the ground and before anybody really knows who you are, I mean, how do you actually gain access to artists to... We booked it through a publicist that I knew named Daniel Gill, who represents a lot of great bands. Um, and Waves was in San Francisco. This was really, you know, right before he decided to get some, started to get some traction. And, I think a lot of it has to do with getting onto bands early, you know, getting involved in their careers early on before they blow up. And there's a lot of evidence of that with yours truly. And that's it's like artists before they get big are just more flexible, easier to work with, have more time. Um, but one of the biggest things was the fact that we were in San Francisco. So you know, bands have a lot to do in LA. They have a lot to do in New York. But oftentimes they just are hanging out in San Francisco because there's really no, there really was no media outlet like yours truly in San Francisco. So we were able to get access to bands based on um, my relationships and Caleb's relationships with label people, with publicists, with managers, and with bands. But um, ultimately, it was just the quality of the work we were able to show them early on. You know, we shot that first Waves video and the band loved it. I was able to get it on Gorilla vs. Bear and Fader and Stereo Gum and Pitchfork right from the outset. So right away we were building a case study for um, what yours truly could be and you know, what the benefits for you, a band, would be for doing yours truly. And um, I think this slide is actually meant to talk about the, the brand yours truly and I kind of want to do that for a sec if I can. Um, so everything about yours truly begins and ends with the name yours truly, which is a way to sign a letter. And a lot of our core values come from this act of letter writing. So, um, so yours truly stands for careful curation because you're not just going to write a letter to anyone. If you're going to put the time and effort into writing someone a letter, you have to make sure that that person is going to reciprocate or they're really worth the time and effort you're willing to put in. So we think about that every time we choose bands. Uh, yours truly stands for high quality but handcrafted. If you're going to write a letter, then you're going to do your best to you know, give your best penmanship, even though mine is always terrible. Um, <laughs> but you're going to do your best to make it look good. But at the same time, like if you, if you mess up or something, that's just part of the fact that, that there's a human writing that. And it's so we want people to see that yours truly is made by real people who really care about what they're doing. And lastly, when you write a letter, you want to be proud to sign the letter and then give that letter to someone. This is yours, truly. And so we think about that every time we make a video. You know, this is kind of a little gift for the bands. It gives them another reason to go out and get people to fall in love with them. It's a gift to fans to get to see another side of an artist that they didn't get to see, or to discover an artist they never knew existed, or to hear an artist speak for the first time. And for us, the gift is that we get to spend this time with these musicians that we, you know, a lot of times have crushes on or love and adore or just are really passionate about. I think uh, the next thing we want to talk about is sort of what is your model for marketing and distribution um, on I the mean, web? You guys, yeah, you, guys don't, you guys don't have ads on your website. Yeah. You, know, you don't have mass marketing campaigns. You know, I mean, we're, everyone here works at Google, so like we know that you know, revenue doesn't, you know, you don't, don't, need, don't need revenue right away. Yeah. But kind of like what is, what is your plan? Yeah, so I sort of equate the yours truly business model to uh, 
a two cross sections of a house. The outside of the house is the beautiful facade, the architecture, the big open windows, the fresh co coat of paint, and that's the Yours Truly brand. That's what we've been really developing this whole time. So, you know, whether you see it on our website, on our Facebook, our Twitter, our Tumblr, or you watch it on our channel on Pitchfork TV, or you see Yours Truly videos on any of the blogs that we push out to, or on our partnerships with MTV, it's this strength in the brand that's been able to get us um, these, high, these uh, integrated partnerships with brands like MTV, Pitchfork, um, Odyssey, which is a local speaker company. Um, we've also done stuff with Levi's and Urban Outfitters. And so it's this strength in the brand that's been able to give us these opportunities to make partnerships where our brand and their brand are you know, getting married for a short period of time to do these series. And that feeds the other side of the house, which is yours truly services, where we offer production services to brands, to media companies like Pandora or MTV or um, beer brands or um, companies like Levi's, like um, Chevy, W Hotels, Braun, Asus. Um, any number of these companies that see the work that yours truly does in its public facing side and you know, attach themselves to that work and then realize that we would be a great fit for a series that they're producing for their own purposes. And so it's sort of this hybrid model of we are a public facing brand and an editorial brand, um, but we're also a production company and offering production services. And it's, it's a cool reciprocation because, you know, just last week someone uh, from an agency reached out and they said, you know, I really like the way Yours Truly videos look. I want to do a series on several artists for a beer brand that I'm working on. And so in that case, we offer our, up our producers and directors to go execute whatever campaigns that they're, that they're trying to do. And that's a good way for us to make money so that we can continue to do all the free editorial stuff that we really want to do. Yeah, and so tell us a little bit about how the web's like played into that, right? I mean, you guys are a blog, or started as a blog, right? And so yeah. what does the web allow you to do and like kind of compare, compare yourself to maybe, maybe even a traditional record company, right? What are you guys using, or how are you using technology to replace certain aspects of it? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the decisions we made early on, and this has a lot to do with the fact that we decided not to have advertising, <coughs> was that um, if you want to sell advertising, you have to drive traffic to your site. But what we wanted to do was to create a push model where instead we would focus on the content and getting the content out to as many places as possible rather than trying to suck people back to our site. So as soon as we release a video, we're encouraging all the blogs who are fans of this band to post, um, to post our video and to link back to our site. So that's to help drive home the brand equity, but also to just expand the reach of our content itself. Because we've always been about the content, the content creation process. So um, we always have had this push model where we're leveraging all the assets that are created in the process. So there's the video, there's the audio of the session that we'll upload to SoundCloud, that will that will route through our Facebook or our Twitter in an effort to get more likes or um, get people to retweet. We do contests for tickets and giveaways and stuff like that. And basically, it's just about leveraging the assets that are created while we're shooting the band. So while we're shooting bands, we're taking Instagram photos and posting those and posting that to Facebook. And um, really, it's, um, it's kind of a different way than a lot of bands approach, sorry, not bands, a lot of websites approach um, building a brand. But for us, it's worked. It's gotten us to be featured and um, in conversations on all these sites that are outside of our network and get people to, you know, maybe if they see it the first time, they'll, they'll just watch the video. But maybe if they keep seeing content on these other sites that they already go to and they keep seeing this link yours truly, they'll end up coming back and realizing that we have this huge catalog of, of bands that we've been shooting and pieces that we've collected over the years. So that's yeah. kind of how we've done it. You guys have been doing a great job. Thanks, bud. Love, love that graphic back um, there. So before we get into uh, more of how you guys are using the web and actually South by Southwest, where um, on one end musicians and then the interactive side sort of came together, met in the middle, and you guys were actually out there together for a day or two. Yeah. Um, we want to watch um, something brand new from you guys. This is actually, um, I think it sort of premiered on YouTube Music. Yeah. Um, that's where I first saw it. Jacob yeah. McPherson from the YouTube team uh, threw this up on the web a couple days ago where you guys were featured on the music page, let's check it out. This is a really cool video. Oh, <laughs> man, I feel good today. I had to get that out. You know, you get a laugh inside you sometimes. A lot of people don't know, but my, um, I live by the, by the rule of, um, if you keep a laugh on the inside, it'll hurt you later. 
So if you got to laugh, laugh out. Let, let it go. Don't hold it down. I believe laugh, laughter is, is a good remedy. I'm not a doctor. Don't claim to be a doctor. I let the doctors be doctors and the lawyers be lawyers. Politicians be politicians. I'm a singer. That's what I do. I had just made him breakfast in our kitchen right before he did that, and uh, we had we had chickens in the backyard of the house, and so he was he wouldn't shut up about the fact that we had fresh eggs. I haven't had fresh eggs since 1973, man. They don't taste the same. <laughs> <It was really fun. laughs> but when he did that scream, that like animal scream, I, I swear the house was like reverberating. It was insane. It was really fun. So that was something you guys filmed in Austin. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, we were out there um, from Monday to Monday this year. So uh, one of our official showcases, which is the white poster right there, um, that was during Interactive. So it was the last night of Interactive. And uh, Caleb produces all of our events. So he put together this event and then another event in partnership with Gorilla vs. Bear. That's the uh, poster on the right. Um, so that was at the Hype Machine Hotel. Um, they have different bloggers curate different shows. And so we, do, we did those two official showcases and then the poster with the State of Texas on it is a poster for our In My Room series, which is in partnership with MTV. And then there's just some stills there. But um, you guys were really busy. We were very busy. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Um, but we shot ten different bands and we had those shows and took a lot, bunch of meetings and just catch up with people in the music business that you only know over email or over the phone. It's like ah, that's what you look like in person. So. There's a lot of that that goes on too, but it was tons of fun, and that was the first piece that we released from our South by Sessions was that Lee Fields video. So, so your your label, Love Letters Inc. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, really come kind of you guys, you guys are you know in, in business terms like right, vertically integrating, right? You're kind yeah. of going end to end. Can you guys give us kind of a sense of like what what your plan is in that in that sense? Like, I mean, I. Are you guys kind of like going to be the first people to go from a blog to a full, full blown record label? Uh, we wouldn't be the first. No, uh, there's there's plenty of yeah, there's other people. Yeah, there's yeah, plenty yeah. of examples of that actually. Um, one of the best examples is a blog out of the UK called Transparent Blog, and they released the first Washed Out single, a bunch of other ones, and now one of the guys has an imprint on Domino Records. But um, <coughs> our idea with Love Letters Inc. Um, was really just to. It's kind of a brand extension of yours truly, but it's really based in our love for physical objects, just like letters. Um, we love to be able to hold something. And so we wanted to be able to give our fans something that they could hold, something that we could design, and something that we could be involved in from start to finish. So when bands are coming through San Francisco to do yours truly sessions, they're playing songs that they've written for an album of theirs or an EP of theirs or something that they've done themselves. but in order to keep innovating, in order to keep you know, doing something new with our format, we wanted to get involved earlier on in the process. So in the songwriting process or in the recording process. And we wanted to offer our fans and fans of these bands better insight into what that process was like. What does it take to make a record? You know? So um, the first record we d ended up doing was this Big Crit record. And Big Crit put out a mixtape that um, I listened to and loved, and uh, this was before he got signed to Def Jam and is kind of like a full-fledged rap star now, but I begged his manager uh, to fly out to San Francisco and I was going to put them in the studio with this great local R&B band. And so um, he came to San Francisco, crashed on my couch for a couple of days, and we made this EP and that became the first Yours Truly release. And the second one had a dress well, the white background with the image in the middle. Um, that was a tribute record. Um, the, the How to Dress Well, um, Tom, who is managed by Caleb, um, his, one of his best friends died. And so what he wanted to do was this EP called Just Once, where he would do orchestral versions of his songs that we would release on 10-inch vinyl and uh, make available for sale. And the one thing that's, u that's unique but is also um, common to each of the releases is that they each have um, a charity element to them. Uh, the Big Crit record, 100% of the proceeds go to the um, go to charity. The the Night Jewel re record and the uh, How to Dress Well record, one dollar of every sale goes to charity. So what we really wanted to do is to create these physical objects and be involved in the record making process, but also create something that we could use to give back to the communities that deserved it. You know, I keep on hearing the word create with you guys, and that's what that's what <laughs> I love about you. It's like you always, you know, you, you didn't see that there were like these behind the scenes videos. So you went and created them, right? And now it's like you want your vinyl records, right? So you're gonna go and create them. Yeah. What else, you guys? You know, what are the projects you guys got up your sleeves? Like, what else is going on? Um, yours truly. Yeah. I mean, so you know, we're constantly producing videos, um, and it's these short, either from short form documentaries to performance pieces to these making of pieces. We're doing EPKs and you know making of album pieces. We did a, a live concert DVD and a documentary. Um, but really, what we're looking forward to this year is um, bringing the Yours Truly experience into the living room, which is something that I know YouTube is focused on too, um, as well as Vimeo. Um, bringing Yours Truly into the living room, uh, improving the Yours Truly site, getting Yours Truly on iPads and on iPhones, and just improving our distribution model to get 
to get to into as many eyeballs and as many homes as possible, as well as to continue to produce the same high quality content that we've been doing all along. But uh, I'll give you kind of a sneak preview of one project that yeah. um, I'm excited about. It's this uh, the Stagger Lee project. So. Um, so in 1895, in a St. Louis saloon, this pimp and hustler, notorious character named Stagger Lee, shot Billy Lyon in the back of the head for trying to steal his Stetson hat. And so this story that happened in the late 1800s, as soon as it happened, it swept through the South. And it was played and covered by whorehouse pianists to um, dust bowl balladeers and passed along before um, recorded music ever occurred just as sort of like a lar like a folk tale and every time whoever sang it was would reinterpret it and stagger lee gets scarier and scarier and he's just this bad villain like character and then when recorded music came around um, the song has since been recorded over 400 times by elvis presley bob dylan mm -hmm. bo diddley whoa um, you name it, the Black Keys, uh, you name it, someone has a version of this song. And so um, this character of Stagger Lee, this badass character, has been you know, in, translated into all these different forms of music, except for the one form that I think it really fits, and that's hip hop. And so what I wanted to do was to update the Stagger Lee saga for the 21st century, to uh, basically find two artists who could play the parts of Stagger Lee and of Billy Lyon. But before they do that, I wanted them to steep themselves in the history of blues music, which is what created this song. So the idea is to send Big Crit and Yellow Wolf down to the Mississippi Delta to have them take a trip um, to Clarksdale, Mississippi, where B.B. King was born and Robert Johnson was born, and to basically soak up the roots of blues music and to use that influence to create a new version of the Stagger Lee song. And we would create a documentary about that journey, a documentary about the making of that song, release that song, do a music video for that song, and basically what the goal is is to bridge the gap between this American roots and folk music that is, has influenced not only hip hop, but R&B and rock and roll, and basically try and bridge the gap between what kids are listening to today and um, this you know, great tradition of American music that is in danger of extinction. And uh, I just remember reading this story for the first time and just thinking, this has to be told. And then when I finally heard Big Crit's music, I realized that he was the guy to play Stagger Lee because he's from Mississippi, he's a producer, his music is so bluesy and soulful, and I thought, you're the guy, you're Stagger Lee. And so um, we have this idea, and it's really just like something we're trying to get made at this point. That sounds really awesome. Um, <laughs> we got a little bit of time left, um, and uh, I think that means it's time to jump on uh, Hangout with Chris. That's cool. what you might have heard uh, for a second there. So I'm just gonna move the computer up so he can see us all, and, um, or at least see us up here. And uh, yeah, let's try to do this. Let's is he see. hanging out? Hopefully this works. Chris, are you here? There he is. There he is. <laughs> hey, how are you? We I'm got uh, Farzad. What's up, dude? Thanks for coming. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Virtual it reality. It's inside of your face, but it looks good. <laughs> He's over <laughs> here. Oh. <laughs> awesome, Chris. Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, of yeah. course, uh, one of the most celebrated videos from yours truly um, comes from the Morning Benders excuses. I think we all pretty much fell for it uh, the first time we saw it. and um, Instantaneously. Uh, I think it's been, um, well, I'll, I'll ask you, what's it been like for the band? What was it like making the video, and what was the, uh, the, re the reaction that you guys got? Oh, well, it was amazing, honestly. Just thinking back to that day, it was so special. And I think we've done a lot of sessions and music videos and stuff like that, and almost 95% of the time we do it, we have no idea how it's going to turn out. And it's just, we kind of let it go and we just hope for the best. But we did that session and we just felt like this is going to be something special. We knew it from the moment, I think, we were done that day. And then we saw the first cut, we were just blown away. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, what, you know, what was sort of like, what did it do for, for you guys as a band? I mean, like, um, uh, people see music videos, but, but nothing quite like that. Um, yeah, yeah. I feel like that was the one piece of content above anything else that we've ever done that people knew about us. You know, we went and toured all over the world and by far the most common thing people would say is, you know, I love seeing you guys play that song in the room. 
by that time, or truly, or whatever. So yeah. people definitely got the word out about it and spread it around themselves, which is like the most powerful thing you can do, you know? That's awesome. Well, um, we, we do hope that you guys have plans to work with uh, yours truly in the future, but, but not as the Morning Benders. It's going to be as uh, Pop, etc. Can you tell us a little bit about the name change and uh, what we could expect um, from uh, the new group, if you can call it that? Yeah, well, um, I wrote kind of a detailed explanation of why we changed the name, um, which I can go into just briefly, I guess. <laughs> do we have time for that? Sure, just briefly. That's fine, totally. Yeah, well, I mean, we named our band the Morning Fenders early on, like a lot of bands do, without thinking about it very much. <laughs> uh, we thought it was funny or whatever, and didn't think much about it. Um, but we found out at some point, like about a year and a half or two years down the line, um, that there was this alternate meaning in the UK and Europe that Fenders was kind of like a slang word, the equivalent of fag or gay, as used in America, like kids call someone gay, thinking it's funny. Um, and you know, we didn't, we're not like super PC guys or felt like, um, you know, it, it's not something we would like correct someone on the street and yell at them, but when it comes to like our band and what we're associated with, it just made sense for us to not be associated with that because it felt like it was giving off this, this feeling or this expression that isn't in keeping with how we feel and how we lead our lives. Um, it just it became ignorant. You know, kids thought we were making a joke in the UK. It's, it just that's not a joke we would make. You know? So um, we're pop etc. now, and we have a lot of exciting stuff coming. And killer <laughs> tunes. Yeah. Um, if you guys haven't heard the new mixtape yet, you could download it from free uh, for free on their website, popetc.com. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and do you think also the new band name in some ways is a prelude to the new sound? Yeah, I was I was telling Will I think the other day that um, you know, the, the motivation behind the name change was what I just told you, but it, it definitely aligned itself with this creative change as well. And we have a whole a whole different set of stuff, and we've always told all our fans that we want to change, and we're not we're not creatively satisfied by staying in the same place. So uh, I know people get their hopes up and they want to hear Big Echo too again or whatever, but. Uh, we just can't do that. I think there's a lot of bands out there that do do that over and over again. They make five or six albums that sound generally the same, um, which is great for some people, but for us, it's not how we want to do it. So yeah, we have this free mixtape out, and we got a free out, uh, a full album, sorry, coming after that, and uh, hopefully some cool videos and stuff as well. Okay, exciting. Um, do you know? Do you guys actually have a release date for that yet? We don't have an exact release date, but it'll be sometime in the summer, like early summer. It's a pretty summery album, so we wanted to align with that. Okay, and hopefully uh, coming back to play a, a hometown show, if I can call it that, um, oh, yeah. sometime soon. Of course, yeah, All it's right. definitely a hometown show. We still consider ourselves Bay Area kids, and we all talk about how we're going to end up back there. So next time, hopefully, I'll be in the room with you instead of on the Google Hangout. Hey, that would be awesome. Uh, hey, welcome anytime. Yep. Chris. <laughs> Do you want to actually, do you want to open up, Chris, do you have like 10 minutes? Or do you have like six yeah. minutes? Because we might uh, open up to questions and, you know, we can have you and Will respond to people's thoughts, questions, sure. interrogations. Do we have a microphone? Yeah. All right, cool, yeah, hang out. <laughs> <laughs> that was a marketing plug. <laughs> we paid him to say that. <laughs> uh, do we have a microphone or no? That, that thing work? Perfect. Check Does anybody... Uh, have any questions for uh, yours truly or Chris Chu? Lisa, um, I'm just give it. we'll just repeat the question. Okay. Uh, how much work, how much time and effort goes into crafting each video? Um, wow. Um, well, there's sort of like three different phases of it. There's the booking of the band, which is finding the bands first of all, which takes a lot of work. I have Google Reader of about 300 different blogs that I read every day. I'd probably say the same is true for Caleb and Nate, but probably 300 different blogs. Um, there's the finding of the band, and then there's the booking of the band, which is a bunch of emails back and forth with their publicist or their manager, just figuring out where we're going to do it, uh, how we're going to do it, and then figuring out how it's going to get recorded. And then there's the actual day of the shoot, um, which is you know, usually just a few hours. Um, and then there's the post-production process, which is handled by Nate or Bob, who are editing the videos. And that's really the most time intensive process. So if I had to put like an hour on each video, I would say like 
16 hours? What do you think, Nate? Sure, why not? 16 to 24 hours, maybe? I mean, it depends on the content, too. Like, if we're doing a documentary or even a short documentary that's really narrative in nature, then that takes much longer to edit than, like, a performance piece would. But, um, like I said, it's, these, it's this whole kind of start-to-finish process that it takes a while, but it's gratifying. Do you find that the, the uh, quality of artists that you work with actually helps uh, that process? I mean, like, when I look at the Morning <coughs> Vendors video and I see this performance, like, it looks effortless, but I can't imagine it was an easy thing to get, you know, a room full of people, well, that's multiple all Chris. drummers. I mean, that, that was Chris's, this is like his, it's, I sort of see it as like your swan song to San Francisco, like your going away present, you know, like, those are all your friends. And I remember <laughs> we were just hanging out, at, like, I knew you just from being a different fur, and it was sort of like yours truly was just getting started, and you guys were, you know, finishing your new album, and you were playing me the mixes, and you were like, I have this idea that... I want to do this piece and invite all these people and it was an honor for you to to have us do it and I think you know the fact that it came out that way is just we kind of met in the middle and just got it done that day and the stars aligned and and all that stuff but yeah I do think it has something to do with the quality of the artists and like I was saying earlier um, we think about people that really kind of deserve the attention and deserve our effort because it is a lot of work to put into a band and so we kind of take this less is more approach where we'd rather shoot way less stuff and have it be way better than um, just be constantly producing content just because we have to. Um, if we had a bigger team then I think you know we might be able to do that but at the same time we, we like you know just you know making each thing we do very special and putting, his, putting our all into it so. Awesome. Um, unfortunately, we're actually running out of time, cool. so that was it. We're gonna have to call it a day. But uh, <laughs> thank come you so much, everybody, to us, yeah. coming out. Chris, thanks so much. Chris. We'll catch up with you later, man. Later, Chris. See you. Yeah.